Jason C. Anderson, and I am here with Stan Parks, and really excited to have a chance to be here with you, Stan, and have this interview. We're talking about how to multiply movements, multiplication principles, and especially what are those key mindset shifts that need to happen as we start to work on multiplying disciples. Stan, you have a lot of experience in this all over the globe, and uh, we're super excited to talk about this today. I'm excited to talk about it with you. Um, I know we'll have different ones joining here soon. Looks like we've got a couple people coming on the call. And as you guys come on, let us know where you're coming in from. I know that'll help both Stan and I to have a context for as we speak to you today and as we talk to each other as well. Um, so let us know where you're coming in from. And if you have a particular question that you would love Stan or I to answer today at any time, feel free to put that there in the chat. And uh, at the end of our talk, for sure, we're going to have some time for questions and answers. So, so excited to be here, Stan. Welcome. And um, yeah, tell us, I, most of the people watching know who I am. I'm a disciple making movement trainer and coach. And I've been in this disciple making church planning movement area working planning a movement myself together with my husband and then training many church planners for about 30 years um and i have an online course that a lot of the people who'll be watching have taken or are considering taking so that's who i am but stan tell us who you are whatever you want to share about yourself and um yeah introduce yourself to us if you would yeah thank you glad to be on the call with you um I was born in Indonesia. My parents were uh, gospel workers there. And then my dad was at the IMB and actually helped put together the unit that included folks like Bill Smith and David Garrison and David Watson and uh, Curtis Sargent, a lot of those early pioneers in movements. So I was hearing about all the crazy stuff they were doing and my dad was working hard to keep them all from getting fired for doing crazy stuff. And so as I heard about movements, um, you know, I, I was actually here in some of the early days of that. So that was pretty exciting. Uh, my wife and I went to Indonesia in 1994 and uh, began working with unreached people there. I tell people I like to train so I can help people avoid making all the mistakes I made when I first started out. Um, had a lot of, you know, my my uh, missiology was some strange mixture of uh, books I'd read and experiences I'd had and church denominational thinking and uh, every once in a while the Bible got thrown in there. So I, I actually just had to start over and let God kind of rebuild my view of disciples and disciple making and uh the great commission right so we've, yeah. been, we've been involved since then and just i train and coach and work with a variety of people around the world that are involved in movements um, part of the 2414 mm -hmm. uh, leadership team which is focused on helping see movements start in every unreached people in place around the world we're not an organization. We're very much a coalition of like-minded people saying, hey, if you're trying to reach the unreached people and you want to do it through movements and you're doing it with urgency, let's help each other do that. Yeah, I love That's that. Little... So appreciate 2414 and um, YWAM Frontier Missions is a part of that. I participated in some of your meetings and um, love the way that you guys pull people together in that network to learn from each other, which is so important. And um, you guys are not stingy. You give away what you know, give away what you have, and um, encourage those who are part of the network to do the same and really appreciate your leadership there, uh, Stan. I also had to laugh, you know, when you said you train so people won't make the same mistakes you did. And I, um, I've often said that myself, you know, we made so many mistakes and in spite of us, God brought about a movement where we were working. It wasn't because we did everything right. But I always, uh, I always tell people make new mistakes. You know, if I can warn you about a few, <laughs> you'll make some, but make your own new ones. So yeah, that I could uh, relate to that statement. We've got some people joining uh, Tuppen. Where are you coming in from Tuppen? And we have Justin from Pakistan. Uh, Fred, 
Where are you from? Let us know. We've got Babul from Pakistan. So we've got a few from South Asia here um, already on the call. Again, Lydia from Chiang Mai. Great to see you, Lydia. And uh, just so good to have you guys here. But And thank you for the introduction, Stan. Well, we want to jump right into our topic and not waste too much more time. But yeah, tell us, what do you think are some of the most important shifts that need to take place in a leader's life um, as they are wanting to see disciples go from a handful of people they're discipling to see hundreds, if not thousands of disciples that are multiplying among their people group in their region? What are what would you say are some of the key mindset shifts that need to take place? And, and feel free to talk about things that need to happen internally in us and things that maybe need to happen in what we do and how we do it as well. So yeah, the floor is yours, Dan. We're ready to learn. Yeah, so I think it's great. I'm just looking at all the different countries people are coming in from, and uh, this is awesome that uh, God is a global God, and he's rebuilding his family from every people and every tribe and every language, every nation. Yeah. And this is a small representation of that. You know, there's some argument about, is it the strategy and the approach that leads to movements or is it the person that leads to movements? Mm -hmm. And uh, I kind of come back to, it's both. Um, I know many, many very godly people who will tell you they've been using the wrong approach and it has not led to multiplication. I know many people who have all the right approach, but spiritually they're not really where god can use them and so mm -hmm. i kind of come back to both it's like a 50 plus year veteran field worker was talking with steve smith uh, who uh, wrote spirit walk and uh, several other things gone to be with the lord a couple years ago and this veteran said you know when we went out we didn't know a lot of the things we needed to do we were kind of bound by tradition and thought we were doing the right stuff and he said so we were methodological pygmies but it was hard to get out there it was hard to live in the countries we went to and and people are very committed and so we had many spiritual giants mm. he said today i'm worried that you know we've learned a lot together and we've passed on what we've learned and we've kind of gone back to a 2000 year old approach that's brand new for today. And uh, he said, I'm worried that a lot of people have become methodological giants, but they're spiritual pygmies. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, some people, sometimes people are like, why does it take so long to see a movement get started? I think a lot of times it's because the, the leaders are not yet ready to handle what's going to have, they're going to have to handle both spiritually and, uh, emotionally and physically and persecution wise and God is preparing the leaders to be able to handle a large move of his spirit mm -hmm. um, so I, I think you know I when I look at movement leaders they're people of prayer they they pray they mobilize prayer they absolutely believe God's the only one who can do this um, they're they're people of sacrifice most of them have pay tremendous prices uh, to do what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, they're, for the most part, they're extremely humble and recognize this is not us, this is God. The real mm -hmm. heroes are the frontline people. Uh, we're not the heroes, you know, and the frontline people tell you, we're not the heroes, it's those guys are the heroes. So I think just that humility. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I think they have learned some things that are important. And they've learned to, in a sense, be deprogrammed from their human tradition, mm. from their Christian tradition. And they've Talk actually been really- A little bit more about that, if you would, Steve, just if I can interrupt. Deprogrammed yeah. from their human tradition, their Christian, maybe Christian traditions, how they've learned how to do church. Can you unpack that just a little bit more? Yeah, so I think, um, rather than letting their view of church be formed by the Bible, by Acts 2, 36 through 47, by all the different uh, leadership patterns, um, 
they've the vast majority of us have grown up in a tradition where we just have these subconscious views. I was recently with a, a movement family in India and they asked me to talk about ordination. I said, you can actually find ordination in the Old Testament. The priests were ordained to provide service to the people and be God's intermediaries. And the kings were ordained to lead the people. You can't find the word ordination in the Greek in the New Testament. And ordination comes from Latin for, for order. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to be a really good Jewish leader, then great, you love ordination. Mm -hmm. If you believe in Peter that says we're all a royal priesthood, we're ordained both as priests and as kings, as royalty, then we're all ordained. And uh, they were there in a context where a lot of traditional Christians saying, you can't baptize, only the ordained pastor can baptize. And, so it's things like that, letting go of our human tradition that, uh, you know, a brand new believer can't can't do anything. You've got to really disciple them thoroughly before you turn them loose, as opposed to, no, actually, you turn them loose immediately and you just help and coach them because they're far better connected to lost people than you are. Right. Um, you know, so just some of those mind mindset shifts that right. uh, education is is important as opposed to obedience. Mm -hmm. You look at our traditional Christian context, the more educated you are, the more qualified you are for leadership, as opposed to in movements, we see the more obedient you are, the more qualified you are for leadership. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to pause leader. you there if, if I sure. could stand just, sure. you know, that's so key. And I want to make sure those who are listening really catch what you just said as a mindset shift that education is more important than obedience. So that's the the old mindset. That's the maybe traditional mindset. I'm looking at the countries that people are represented from here today. And I'm thinking, yes, Northeast India, that is definitely a mindset there. You know, we look at parts of Africa, definitely a mindset. So shifting our thinking to, it's actually- Everywhere those, in the Christian world, that's a mindset. Everywhere in the Christian world, you are so right. Yeah. You think about it, the original sin of Adam and Eve was wanting to know the things God knows without obeying him. Mm. And in the Christian, the Christian world, unfortunately, many times, we want to know things about God or about his word without focusing on obedience. Yeah. And we're just repeating the original sin of, well, I, I like to know these things. I'll kind of pick and choose what I obey as opposed to, no, no. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. Yeah. And if you, if you obey me, you'll remain in my love. Mm. Yeah. We sometimes say obedience is God's love language. Mm. And yet, Obedience is not necessarily in fashion, particularly in the West, but really all over the world. It's it's being knowledgeable, being able to demonstrate your knowledge, being able to have your degrees, being Reverend Doctor So and So. Uh, and I don't even know, Stan, if you're a doctor or not, but um, I would guess you you might be because you're a knowledgeable guy. But you don't talk about that because you value obedience even more than all those degrees and knowledge. And that's what you're seeing causes movements. And um, yeah, I just, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I went to seminary. I, I got a master's and a doctorate. And I had to come to the point of saying, you know what? I don't know anything. I actually am worse off than people who don't know anything because I know a lot of the wrong stuff. Mm -hmm. And I had to say, with the help of of many friends around the world, God helped me rebuild my understanding of scripture. And then things I had learned in seminary could come back into play, but I just had them in the wrong place. I had them as the foundation as opposed to scripture as the foundation. And, or I had a mixture, I had some scripture and some tradition. And so I, I tell people new believers are actually far better off than most of us because they don't have to unlearn a bunch of stuff. Like this one lady in India, they asked her to speak in a leadership meeting at a movement and that she's a part of. She stood up. She said, I don't know why they've asked me to speak. She said, I've only been a follower of Jesus five years. I can't read. I can't write. My niece reads the scripture to us every morning. And then we just do our best to remember it and, and apply it during the day. She said, you know, we go out and we 
tell them about Jesus and we heal the sick and we cast out demons and we've only seen a couple of people brought back to life. I know some people have seen a lot more than that. And, you know, in five years, we've only planted 50 churches or so. And, you know, a lot of people have done a lot more than that. And, but to her, that was normal. Mm. And in movements, that is normal. They read the book of Acts and they, oh, okay, that's what we are. That's who we are. That's what we do. And they had the huge advantage of that is what they expect to do and they expect God to do it. And he often does it. Whereas we've kind of bought into some sort of a strange non-book of Acts approach to things. Mm, yeah, so good. And um, a, a challenge for all of us, you know, definitely a challenge for me you know, to keep walking in obedience. And the more we know, the more is expected of us by the Lord. And and yet that emphasis on obedience based discipleship is, is just definitely not the paradigm or the way of thinking that many of us were raised in. And so a major shift to over teach less, but obey <laughs> and even keep teaching the same thing over and over until you start to see obedience. Well, John six, Jesus says only those the father draws come, come to me. Those who listen and learn from the father will, will come to me. Mm. What is the difference between listening and learning? You know, we think they're the same thing, but I think it means you listen and learn means you actually start to live it out. You start to apply it. You start to, it starts to change the way you operate. You know, in Matthew 28, Jesus says, go make disciples of all ethne, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. I'll sometimes get in churches, I'll ask people to quote the Great Commission, and, and a good number will say, and teach them all that I've commanded you. He said, teach them to obey all that I've commanded. And some people are like, oh, that's legalism. Well, Jesus said it, so I don't think it's legalism. And the difference is, are you obeying out of, I'm trying to earn God's favor, or I'm trying to fulfill religious obligations, or, you know, I don't do it perfectly, but I do a lot of things my wife wants me to do because I love her. I'm, I'm doing the thing, you know, I do a lot of things for God because I love him. I want to do it. It's mm. not I have, to do it, I want to do it. And that's what Jesus said. I want you to love me. And out of a love, I want you to obey and do the things I've asked you to do. And your obedience shows your love for me. And your obedience keeps you firmly within that love relationship. Right. Yeah. So good. So you've you've talked quite a bit here just, you know, in the last few minutes about the shift from knowledge or education to obedience being what we value. And um, yeah, that is so important. You talked a little bit about the, the priesthood of all believers, how every believer is involved. Um, any mindset shift on that that you want to kind of unpack a little more before we go on to others, which I'm sure you have to share with us? Yeah, I think this whole idea that the most churches have adopted a model that says one person is the leader, as opposed to leadership in the Bible, in the biblical church, New Testament church, is always plural. It's always multiple leaders. You know, I kind of have a theory about the church in Antioch. It names five leaders. I, I think, well, I wonder if those were the, the fivefold gifts the pastor, the teacher, the prophet, the apostle, the evangelist. Mm -hmm. um, most of our churches have bought into a model that says the pastor and or the teacher and or someone who's a kind of a pastor teacher is the leader. But the pastor teacher role is focused internally, where the apostle, prophet, evangelist is focused externally. For To have well-balanced churches, we should have leaders who, who are exhibiting are fulfilling all five of those roles to equip everyone to do the work, not to do the work, but to equip the rest of the body to do the work. And so I think the mindset, mindset shift away from a singular kind of CEO pastor, a pastor who's primarily focused on uh, either pastoring or you know, shepherding or teaching and or both, as opposed to multiple, you know, plural leaders, multiple leaders, uh, both internal and externally focused. Um, that's one of the big shifts that that really needs to happen. And, you know, who is the church? Well, we're, our leadership is not biblical, so 
it's no wonder our churches aren't actually uh, healthy in a biblical sense. Mm, right. Uh, and I, I noticed you mentioned, and it's, you know, there in scripture, the role of those gifts is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So they're not doing all the preaching and teaching and apostle work and evangelist work, but they're equipping people in those areas. And um, when, when you have leaders who are servant leaders equipping others, then we start to see the kind of multiplication that um, we're all dreaming of. And those who are watching this, I know, are people who are dreaming of and believing God for movements in their areas. So, so good. Yeah, what else would you add as key shifts that need to take place in our minds? and in our hearts yeah you know back in 2010 we had a meeting with 38 movement catalysts this is kind of early on um steve smith and and others helped organize and he had a lot of key catalysts there you know uh, ying kai ying and grace kai and bill smith and victor john and david watson and curtis arts and much of those folks and so we asked the question, what does that, what does the outside catalyst bring to the table that's crucial, that's just absolutely necessary? Mm -hmm. And really we came, the group agreed with the kind of two key answers. One was they bring a God-sized vision and they either find people who have the same vision and they join forces or they cast the vision and people catch it, or sometimes both. And then the second was they bring some some tools, some, uh, you know, everybody wants to multiply. Well, here's some tools that can help, you know, biblical tools, patterns that can help you do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really come back to why, have, why has God begun movements? I think a lot of it was people who, and this has happened all throughout history. Movements are not brand new. They've, movements have happened all throughout history. I think when someone accepts a God-sized vision mm. that says, like the Great Commission, Matthew's Great Commission, is make disciples of all ethne. That means your your object of discipling is an ethne. Your object of discipling. Let me pause you a minute. What does ethne mean? I know what it means, but some people yeah. watching might not. Yeah. So it's often an English translated nation that's pretty misleading because we tend to think of political nation states. So they're 220 plus in the in the world. The word ethne we get ethnic from um, means an ethno linguistic people. They have their own culture, their own language, their own identity. Um, so Indonesia, for instance, is one political nation state. It has 800 different. They actually have a word for it, sukus ethne, uh, have their own language, their own culture, their own identity. So in the mm -hmm. world, there's 17,000 plus ethne, these ethnic linguistic groups, um, as opposed to 200 plus nation states. So Jesus right. was saying, disciple the 17,000, not disciple the, the 200. That's so, a big thing. <laughs> that's a, so when you say, hey, what, some of the early guys, what would it take to disciple 13 million Zhuang of China. What would it take to disciple 5 million uh, Chinese of Hainan Island? What would it take to disciple 80 or I think 90 plus million Bhojpuri language speakers in India? Mm -hmm. Do that. Oh, there you are. So I think you lost me for a second there, or I yeah. lost you. Yeah, go ahead. So if you're trying to reach, if you're trying to see 90 million Bhojpuri speakers of India discipled, you have to approach it completely differently from the way you would if you were saying, hey, I'm here to plant a church or two. And so they, these men and women accepted God's call to, I want you to help see an entire people group discipled mm. an unread people group that forces you to do things differently it mm -hmm. forces you to massive prayer and prayer mobilization because you know only god can do this it forces you to not depend on outside resources because there's no way you could ever bring enough outside resources in 
it forces you to recognize the local new believers have got to be the ones who reach their own people. You know, Acts 19, <coughs> it says in two years, every Jew and Greek in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, how do you do that in two years? Because if you send someone to seminary, it takes them three years, right? It had to be. <laughs> three years Paul, gone. Paul trained and equipped people, and they trained and equipped people, and they trained and equipped people. Mm. And it spread from this daily equipping in the Hall of Tyrannus to, at that time, Roman census tells us about 15 million people in that province. Mm. So this God-sized vision forces you to do things differently. Now, I'll tell you a quick story about that. Let me take a drink first. Uh, in Africa, there's a, a movement catalyst team now that are seeing God do some amazing things. Back in about 2002 to 2005, they, <coughs> excuse me, they had started work and they had seen about 220 churches planted among, uh, at that point, former Muslims. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, most people yeah. tell you three years. Wow. But the problem was God had told them that they needed to reach an entire region, which included like seven countries. And to do that, the first kind of the first goal was at least 10,000 churches to begin the task of reaching all those seven countries. Mm -hmm. Well, 220 churches isn't going to get you there. So the vision forced them to change and be willing to change what they were doing. At that point, they got introduced to some movement training because they were desperate to see their people reach. They said at first, really, this is crazy stuff. But they were, in a sense, forced to listen, looking for answers. And God showed them a better way. And then the, the next year after that training, they saw 900 plus churches planted. And they have now, in those 15 or so years, seen about 10,000 churches planted in that region. And they recognize there's still more to be done. That, that didn't, didn't stop there. But without the God-sized vision, I think they would have still been on that 70 churches a year paradigm, as opposed to what's turned into, you know, hundreds and even thousands of churches. Right. Yeah, that's so key. And um, in, in the course that uh, many of these people have taken, our first module is all about God-sized vision and uh, stretching ourselves. And when people will write, and some of them who are watching maybe have done this, they, they write their vision and it's, it's too small. I'll write back and say, that's not a God-sized vision. That's, that's very doable in our human strength. You know, let's dream outside of what we can do and what we can do alone or what our denomination can do or what our church can do. But it really does come from God. Um, it's not something we can manufacture by just trying to dream big. So maybe you could just talk about that a few minutes, if you would, Stan. How do you receive that kind of a vision for an entire people group or even the faith to believe for it if you're starting to think about that? Um, maybe some of the people that you know who have had that. Yeah, we, we know biblically it's God's vision already yeah. that every person hear the gospel that every people group is thoroughly discipled what does that mean i think it's got to mean you've got lots of churches and lots of disciples multiplying so in that sense we already know god's vision we don't have to wonder if that's his vision that's right yeah the question we have to ask is is this what you're calling me to do and who else are you calling to do this and if you're calling us to do this, what what price are you asking us to pay? Or price mm -hmm. is, are you asking us to pay? Um, you know, often it's more important. This is a mindset shift. It's often more important what you stop doing than even what you start doing. Mm -hmm. Many people, have, as God has called them and said, hey, I want you to be a part of seeing a movement among these people. This, the, the other question begins, we have, who else is God calling to that same vision? And mm -hmm. how can we together become a team that pursues that vision together? And then, God, what, is, what do you want us to stop doing? 
because mm -hmm. there are always things you're doing that are counterproductive or they're stealing your time from the things you need to be doing. And some of the things you like doing, they're, you, you enjoy doing it and they're fun and they're, you're good at it. And well, that's not the question. In fact, this is a key phrase. I, I imagine you've used it as well. The question is not what can I do, but what must be done? Mm -hmm. Or some people will put wig take, what's it gonna take? Mm -hmm. Which is David Garris's publishing house, wig take publishing. Um, so just say it one more time, Stan, for those who are listening. What's, so it's what's, not what can I do, but what must be done. Mm -hmm. Or a, another way to put it is what is it going to take to see this vision happen? Right. And again, that forces us into a, a global body of Christ approach. Who else in the global body is God calling to be a part of this? Mm. Who else has has some of the skills, the abilities, the prayer, the talents that God wants to be a part of this? You know, the crux is always local people, but all of these movements have people from outside those people, that local group helping. And that you know, we God loves that sense of kind of building the John 17 unity as we work together to make these things happen. So mm. we have to quit saying, well, I can do this, or I like doing this, or I'm good at doing this. That's not the question. Mm -hmm. What will it take to see your entire people group, your entire city, your entire language group, your entire nation? What will it take to see that entire group reached with the gospel so that they're multiplying churches and multiplying disciples among them. Mm, that's so good. And yeah, maybe you could give a personal example. I'm thinking of an example in my own mind of the start stop related to this. What will it take? Um, not what can I do, but what will it take to see this people group reach, to see this vision come about? Um, some of the things I've had to stop doing that were hard because I like doing them or I was good at them or sometimes they made me feel good. You know, because they, they other people praised me for them. <laughs> you know, there were things that that um, I had to stop doing and start doing things I didn't necessarily get a lot of accolades for or didn't even like doing that much. But I knew it was what it was going to take to be able to move this vision forward. Um, do you have a personal example or an example from a movement leader of some of the kinds of things people have to stop and start to get it done? Yeah, a, a couple thoughts on that. One would be. Um, we have often mistaken teaching for lecturing, right? So I, I like to lecture. I like people listening to me. I'm, you know, have done it quite a bit. And I had to recognize, well, teaching is causing to learn. It's not lecturing. So most of the way I train in DMM now is inductive biblical studies. I don't talk that much. I might give examples or, but I'm not the one giving information. <clears throat> I'm saying to people, hey, if this is in scripture, if it's in scripture, do it. If it's not, don't. It's not my opinion. Oh, I think we lost you again for a minute. You're such a... Oh, you're back. Yeah, I, I, I think our connection is just a little spotty. Yeah. Anyway, just moving from the, the teacher on a pedestal role, imparting wisdom to my students, to I'm not the teacher, John 6, God himself will teach them. I'm trying to put them in a position to listen and learn from God and then help coach them to apply those things. Right. So changing the, my, my personal view of teaching is one thing. Um, uh, so someone's asked on here, can you please give uh, uh, emphasis on why education is not that much important. Um, I would say this, we have mistaken education with knowledge alone, as opposed to education is knowledge that you apply, right? So if someone knows 10 things and obeys nine of them, they're actually more mature than someone who knows 100 things and obeys nine of them. And we've created a context in, in Christianity around the world where we're like, I want to know a hundred things. I want to know a thousand things. Yeah, I do a few of them. As opposed to, no, what I learn, I what I 
what I hear, what I listen to, I now learn by doing. In fact, the learning pyramid, some of you might be familiar with, if what you listen to is you're only going to remember 5% of that, right? So, sorry, we're on a podcast. It's not a way we can do it. Um, <laughs> but what you take notes about, you can remember like 15% of that. Then if you talk with some other people about that, you can get that closer to, you know, 30, 40%. If you go do something based on what you just heard, you can get that closer to, you know, 60%. If you teach someone else how to do what you just learned, you're getting closer to 80, 90%. So teaching is all of those pieces. One of the things I love about just DMM training and even what we would call DMM church is all aspects of those are included. I'm learning I'm discussing, I'm passing it on to others, I'm applying it. All of that is what we would call education. And so education is important, information is important, knowledge is important, but only if it's in the right mix of knowledge and application, information and passing it on to others. You know, all of those put together. Yeah. That's so good. Um, knowledge puffs up, as it says in scripture, you know, but it's when we obey and we pass on and we try to apply that that knowledge doesn't puff, puff us up because we're we're hitting those obstacles. We're trying to apply. We're needing the Holy Spirit's help to put those things into practice. And uh, sometimes we're failing, you know, <laughs> we come back to God. It's not puffing us up, but it's developing us and maturing us uh, if we apply and if we put it into practice, which I like you so appreciate in uh, the DMM or Discovery Bible Study groups, the T4T groups, that those that application and sharing with others immediately is so much a part of the normal normal structure that we practice. So so good. Yeah, a lot a lot of groups, like I said, uh, the T4T three thirds or DMMs uh, Discovery Bible Study, they all have this emphasis on you are learning. What do we learn about God? What do we learn about people? You know, what do we learn about ourselves? But there's also the, now how will I obey this? Mm -hmm. And who will I share it with? I tell people, if you want to differentiate kind of a traditional Bible study from a multiplication Bible study, make sure you add, how will I obey and who will I share with? Right. Because most Bible studies are, what am I, what information am I gaining? Which is good, but without applying it and without passing it on to others, you're really short circuiting. Yeah, absolutely. And yet those are often the ones when people run out of time that they skip, aren't they? In that <laughs> I, uh, one of the coaching groups that they were just, in fact, several coaches is kind of a coaching group of coaches. They were saying, we actually start with those questions. How did you apply slash obey? Who did you share with? And then we go to some of the other questions because if we do run out of time, we're always going to short, you know, give those the, the shorthand. Right. Yeah. Those are the ones that actually drive multiplication because right. they're at, they're requiring us to be accountable for putting things into practice. So, so good. Yeah. Well, time is going by really fast and I want to make sure we get to some of the other questions that we, um, we were going to talk about today, but, yeah, any um, any of these shifts you've already talked about or other shifts that you see in, in the Word of God, in Scripture, in some of the movements that took place in the Bible or in historical movements um, that you'd like to highlight to us? Yeah, so I was, you know, your question about uh, in the Bible, I thought, what, what kind of shifts do we see? Um, you know, really, you've got the disciples. Jesus has already risen. He's been with them. 40 days, and they're like, Lord, will you now restore the kingdom to Israel? They still didn't catch it. Mm -hmm. And then you see them after the Holy Spirit comes, these are totally different people. And I think the mind shift of the Holy Spirit showing them, hey, this is about all the nations. This is not about power. This is about service. In fact, 11 of the 12 actually were executed, mm -hmm. uh, died as martyrs. Um, so that, that I think was a huge shift. 
Um, you, you see the apostles appoint the deacons. Interestingly, at that point, the story picks up with two of the deacons. Mm. So it's not just focused on the 12 leaders. It now begin, you begin to see other leaders emerge. Mm. Um, and, you know, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch and uh, Philip's in Samaria. And another paradigm shift you see in scripture is Acts 8.1 where persecution drove the church out. And some commentators, you know, I, I, I kind of go back and forth on this. They're like, well, Acts 8, 1 happened because they weren't actually obeying Acts 1, 8. They weren't going out. Uh, you kind of see that. And God used persecution to force them out. Mm. And they then went out and began to, to spread. I think per Peter and Cornelius, obviously, right, Corn Peter had to see the vision yeah. three times. Yeah. And I tell people, who was more eager, Cornelius or Peter? Mm -hmm. Right? Cornelius is far more eager. A lot of times the persons of peace that we're looking for, they're far more eager to hear the truth than we are to go give it to them because it's a little dangerous. Mm -hmm. so that, or they're that's from me. a people group we don't really like or have much relationship with. Yeah. Right. I mean, when Jesus said, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Samaria, they were, Samaritans were close by. You had to walk from, from uh, Jerusalem to Galilee. You had to walk through Samaria or often they would walk around it, right? Jesus would take them through it. They hated the Samaritans. Mm -hmm. So who do you hate and who hates you? Mm -hmm. Not who's far away from you, but who, who do you hate? That's who God wants you to bring the gospel to. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Acts 15 was a huge paradigm shift of, no, the Gentiles don't have to become Jews first to follow Jesus. They can actually follow Jesus directly. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul's missionary journeys. I Again, I, I'm not 100% on this. I, I think I see a progression. And I, I know others have said this. Paul's methodology matured. He he went from kind of doing it himself, you know, with, a, with Barnabas to... His third quote journey, he's he's equipping others to do it. He seems mm -hmm. to stand up this the whole time, and they're the ones who go out. Mm -hmm. And then his quote journey to prison, he's writing letters and coaching and advice to others who are doing it from afar. So I, I think that seemed to be a progression. Um, sure. So anyway, you, you definitely see some of that uh, in Scripture. I, I think historically, um, let me stop there. You got any? comments on that or any thoughts on that oh um, no i think you've highlighted some of the big ones um and i would just you know again some of those who i'm, I'm looking at um just want to highlight or put an exclamation point on that one of, that we see in scripture of them the holy spirit opening their eyes to see the need to go to other peoples who are near to them and don't have the gospel and I know uh, we sometimes call those near culture peoples. You know, so many of the unreached, um, there are Christians who live, I'm thinking Northeast India, I'm thinking Nigeria, you know. Um, they live near them, but they're culturally very far. And uh, there's those, you know, dislike or hatred, or maybe they've been persecuted even by those people groups. But the Holy Spirit getting a hold of us as he did um, and that can be a mindset shift that can really release multiplication as we're willing to respond to the Holy Spirit's conviction and his work in our lives. So, yeah, so good. Um, I, I, to, to me, one of the exciting things about movements, I think historically in the last you know, 250 years, as Western missionaries, all too often the message was, hey, you're new, you don't know that much. Um, you're not qualified to be a leader in another five or seven years. We teach you to think and act like us. Um, you're too poor or too uneducated or don't have enough training to go reach other people. You can do that later. In movements, we're actually seeing a lot of people very quickly jump outside their group because when we tell, when we quit telling them not to do it, they go ahead and do it because the Holy Spirit's telling them to do it. And mm -hmm. so I think of a, a, move, a family of movements in, in um, Southeast Asia, they're impacting over 130 people groups. I was just with a movement family in India. They're impacting 344 groups, you know, different ethnic groups, language groups 
and they got started about 10 years ago. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of a movement in, in uh, Africa. They're impacting 153 groups. Now, they're impacting 147 groups, and they have 153 on their radar they're not yet working with. Mm-hmm. So to me, you know, we think mindset shift. Most movements very quickly start crossing cultures and crossing language groups and crossing ethnicity. And I think that's a huge, like we're, we're recognizing 80 to 90% of movements are being started by the movements. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that they've got the right DNA. They don't have the wrong baggage. They just get after it and God uses them very quickly uh, mm-hmm. to reach out by themselves. Yeah. So good. And um, like you said, because there's that obedience-based discipleship, they're looking at scripture. It, Jesus told us to make disciples of all nations. Let's go. You know, that's for us. Um, they don't have to. Yeah, they just believe it and do it. And um, yeah, so so important and so good. Um, for others, I think there's maybe a, a shift that has to take place, a, a conviction and a response as well, like like what there was in Peter. Um where there's maybe more hatred or things in, in place there. Yeah, move, movements are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, it's interesting to me, Paul, early in his career, says, I'm the least of the apostles. Kind of mid-career, he says, I'm the least of the saints. And then later in his career, a couple, several years later, he says, I'm the chief of sinners. Mm-hmm. I think Paul's opinion of himself went down the more he followed Jesus. And his opinion of Jesus went up. And I, I found that. I used to think, you know, I'll become mature and I'll just keep getting more and more mature and I'll have everything figured out by the time I'm about 40 and then I'll just coast on the <laughs> spiritual cloud. And I really actually have seen the longer I follow Jesus, the more I recognize my own sin and failure. And the more I recognize he's the one who's got to do it. So these movements are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, I uh, work with several movements in India where Hindu background believers have recognized, well, wait a minute, we're not practicing the Lord's Supper. Why is that? And they go back and look at scripture and recognize their caste prejudice from their previous life has infected their their life as Christians. So they'll, mm-hmm. they'll meet with people, but they don't want to eat with them. Well, they repent of that. They, they ask forgiveness. You know, they and that that's a huge shift. Um, others are saying, you know, they're scared of or afraid of Muslims. Mm-hmm. And we've seen some of them, you know, it, it's not as hard to reach a different Hindu from a different caste or different language group. Mm-hmm. But it's hard to reach a Muslim when you're a Hindu background person or a Christian background person. And God has worked on them. Hey, you got to let go of that hate and that prejudice and that fear. Mm-hmm. Let me show you how to reach them. And we're seeing mm-hmm. some of them really begin some significant work. So I, I think it's an ongoing process of we're all, all of us, where are we? God wants to take us that, you know, further yeah. from that. That's right. You mean, Stan, you don't have it all figured out? All these mindset shifts aren't completely full in your life? Let me let, me let you talk to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Yes, we're all still in process, and we so need the Holy Spirit to bring about these shifts and highlight them in our lives. But yeah, I want to take some questions. And if you guys are watching and you have a question for Stan that you'd like to ask, go ahead and put it there in the chat. I see Lisa ask a question we want to answer. But just before we go to the Q&A time, Stan, of all these different mindset shifts, and I'm sure there's more that we could have talked about today if we had more time, but what would you say is the most important one um, that if, you know, if those who are listening were just to have one thing that they start to really pray about, work on, what would you say is the most important to see multiplication? Yeah, so you, you gave me that question uh, before this call. I've been thinking about some. So some of us have heard the statement by John Knox, give me Scotland. Sometimes it's misstated or I die. It's actually air I die before I die was yeah. his statement. Well, John Knox was at a time when Scotland was under the rule of France 
and they were enforcing uh, Roman Catholicism, which had uh, bishops committing adultery and, and selling indulgences. And I mean, it was a very corrupt system. Mm -hmm. And he was actually a slave on a French galley ship for 10 years uh, outside of Scotland. And he, two other people, men he worked with were burned at the stake mm -hmm. for trying to bring the truth of scripture to Scotland. So sometimes we think, oh, you know, isn't that a great sentiment? He, here was a guy, he, you know, he fled the country. He came back under the threat of death. He, he had colleagues who were killed. He was a slave. He said, God, give me my country. Give me my people before I die. And he was willing to risk death. You know, people were like, don't come back. Stay in Geneva. He came back. Um, you know, he was enslaved. He so I, I kind of come back to, I think the number one mindset shift is God can and wants to reach my people. And I can and will pray and work and sacrifice anything and everything to see that happen. And God, I'm asking you to do it in my generation. I'm not asking you to do it. So I'm, I, and I'm willing to pay the price of imprisonment of death and i when i think of catalysts these are the kind of people god uses they're a thousand percent sold out to god they're completely willing to pay any price necessary and they have this burning burden to see their entire people reached with the gospel mm -hmm. yeah yeah Lord, give each one of us that kind of burning passion that it's a gift from god it's not something we can conjure up but it's something that just we we have to say, God, put that heart that's in you inside of me for my people. And um, I know there's some who are watching here. Uh, I see their names there and know them. And they are people who have that um, kind of burning passion inside of them. And um, so we've got some questions. And uh, yeah, I want to want to look back at those. Let's see here. Um, Lisa asks, how do you find a balance between working hard and praying and trusting for God to move? Um, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, people talk about, you know, really, we need a balanced life and a healthy life. And, and, and that's true. Absolutely. Uh, most of these movement catalysts are a little extreme or a lot extreme. <laughs> They're people who are just driven and they will burn the, they'll just, uh, the, I started using the idiom, burn the candle at both ends. They, they're not very balanced. Now, they're, they're great fathers and mothers to their kids. Often their kids are part of the ministry. Um, you know, some of them, I think, work too hard. They ought to take a little bit of a break from time to time. But, but they are absolutely driven to do everything they can. So mm -hmm. I could look at that and say, well, you know, psychologically, I think they're out of balance. That's the kind of people God tends to use to see movements get started. Is the oh, and what we would call overcommitted, overzealous. You know, I, I think Paul was probably kind of like that. On the other hand, we also say only God can start a movement. Mm -hmm. I, I can't make it happen. Um, I, I think of Victor John, you know, they've seen this incredible movement of 30 million plus people in North India in the last 30 plus years. And I said to Victor, you know, what do you say when people say, wow, look at all that God's done through you and your team? He said, I, I don't think about that. He said, I think about this 750 million lost people who still haven't heard the gospel. And I think, what could we have done better? What did we do wrong? What could we have changed? What can we change right now that would reach more of them? He said, I think of all the people we've failed to reach, not all the people we have reached. So to me, that's kind of the balance of, hey, God's doing some great stuff. Victor works like a crazy man, but he's still, he's never gonna be satisfied until everyone's heard the gospel. Yeah. That being said, we've seen people do quote, same approach, same efforts, same things. They're not yet seeing a movement. Okay, mm -hmm. God, God brings the fruit. You don't bring the fruit. 
the mm. question is, are you doing the right things that can lead to multiplication? Mm. Um, you know, Steve Smith's analogy of the sailboat. You're in a sailboat, the sail's up, wind doesn't blow, you're not going anywhere. You're in a sailboat, the sail's not up, the wind blows, you're probably not going anywhere. So you got to be in the sailboat and raise the sail, which is our job. We've put the pieces in place that could lead to multiplication, that don't create unnecessary barriers, that don't take human tradition over biblical strategies and patterns and principles. So we've done our part. But until the Holy Spirit blows, it's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. So it's both. God's waiting for us to put the sails up, but sometimes we're waiting for him to blow. And sometimes he's saying, well, you're not quite ready for me to blow, so i got to work on you some more. So we tell people, are you doing the things that could lead to multiplication? And timing is all about God. Mm-hmm. Not, oh, this guy's better than you are because he's he or she, they've seen something. You haven't. No, zero. That never is the case. Mm-hmm. But some are people are doing things that could help multiplication. Some are not. And we keep trying to let God prune the things that won't lead to multiplication. And then when he's working, our sales are up to go with him. Mm, yeah, excellent. So balance is sometimes overrated. And <laughs> um, especially, I think, in a Western context, not to say that we have to work you know, like crazy people all the time without ever taking Sabbath and obeying God's command for that. But it's the people who are so passionate and so driven, not driven by their passion to succeed, but driven by that urgency that burns in their heart to reach their people. Those are the kind of people that catalyze or release movements. And um, yeah, excellent. We've got a question from Stefan. He says, how can we get churches to receive the vision for the UPGs in their neighborhood? Often there are churches around, but they lack the vision to reach out to them. You know, we typically uh, have seen a situation where we cast vision um, and we're just seeing who responds to that vision. So, uh, for instance, working with churches in Indonesia, you know, I, I would be friends with pastors. That's that's a key. Be their friend. Don't be their enemy. Mm-hmm. Don't be disrespecting them. Or I say, like, I know you're super busy. I also know you have a heart for lost people. Who do you have in your church that's kind of geared toward that? Maybe they're already doing it. And we could help them look at some biblical approaches that might, uh, that around the world has helped people be more fruitful. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not expecting you. You've already got a full-time job and that, you know, now some pastors end up doing it. But what we've typically found is we're their friend. We're on their side. And we're saying, hey, we know you want to reach lost people. How could we help you do that? We're not mm-hmm. stealing your people. We're just going to equip them. And hopefully you'll send them out and see some things happen. And then um, they're still they're still your people. You're still rejoicing. You're still praying for them. You're still sending them out. But, but they're doing things outside the walls that you can't do inside the walls. Um, so casting vision and then training and equipping those who respond and not not creating a fight with the with the local church and recognize that the, the whole church won't do it, but some will typically. Yeah, so good. Uh, someone, Andrew, asked about shift in mobility. Um, yeah, that that's actually on a lot of people's radar. They're saying, um, hey, how do we reach the people in cities? Uh, how do we reach refugees? In the Middle East, there have been significant multiplication movement started among Syrian Arabs and Syrian Kurds and Iraqi Kurds and Iraqi Arabs. And and now they're taking it back to their home or they're taking it to wherever they're immigrating to. So there are, we need more attention to that, but there are some people giving attention to that. Um, and one of the exciting things is when you train and equip people, no matter where they go, they can start multiplying. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people got equipped in Lebanon and then they went to Germany and they're reaching lost people in Germany and multiplying there. Or they're training their friends on Facebook that are Afghan refugees in 10 countries. And, uh, you know, so trying to take advantage of migration as opposed to losing ground because of it. 
Yeah, that's great. Well, we are on the hour. We've been um, been here for an hour already. I want to make sure that I ask this. How do people find out more um, from you, the resources, trainings at 2414 or that you have to offer? Um, how can they get in touch or if they have more questions? Um, and we'll take note of any questions that people ask who watch this later and try to respond to them as well. But um, yeah, how can people get in touch? Yeah. so. Uh, you're welcome to drop me a note. Um, you can write me at stan at 2414now.now.net. Uh, I'd encourage you to go to the 2414now.net website. Um, and really, anybody who's doing movements in the world, trying to reach the unreached, that's that's who 2414 is. Um, so we've got we've got links to training, including. Uh, this this group that uh, that you're a part of here, including other groups, including books and materials and resources, uh, contacts, etc. So I'd say that website, and then you're welcome to write me as well. And um, and your host is a great resource as well. I realize some of you are already connected to her, but um, yeah, in the movement world, we're like, hey. Well, let's, I don't know. I'll help you connect to someone who might know. Let's help you. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Wow. Do you have time for one more or should we wrap it up? No, absolutely. I, I, I see a couple of questions on there. One's from VJ. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, I, I would say this about um, transgender. The a movement leader I know had this conversation this last year during COVID where they were actually helping some transgender people, uh, community in their country who weren't getting any help, any food or anything. They were totally cut off and they were bringing them food. And, and he said, I asked them, what do you guys want? They said, we actually want to be accepted as people. So they said, yeah, we accept you. And they're studying the Bible with them. They say, if you don't stay the Bible with us, we'll still help you out. Um, so, there, there's no difference between them and any other group. You're saying God wants you to know him. He wants to be known by you. And we want to help you do that. And uh, no matter who you are or where you're coming from. Um, well, loving acceptance and getting them into the word and letting the Holy Spirit do his stuff is what I hear you saying. Yeah, so good. And then Jacqueline <clears throat> asked a question about someone reverting to their old religion. I'd say that's pretty unusual. Um, so that might be a question to maybe get some help offline on. I would say that one of the strengths in movements and churches is you have multiple leaders. And so if one leader reverts or falls into sin or, or dies, uh, you're not dependent on that one leader. A movement can't happen with dependency on one or a few leaders. Movements can only happen with many leaders at, at every level. And mm -hmm. so that lessens the impact of a leader you know, who encounters either personal difficulty or illness or even death. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Well, once again, thank you so very much for your time. I've enjoyed our conversation, learned a lot, had some things that I already knew kind of re-emphasized today and some that are new to me and I especially enjoyed the conversation about the the biblical mindset shifts and your thinking on that and some of the others as well I know those who've been listening have been learning as well um, one of the things we talked about was putting things into practice sharing it with others so I would just exhort and challenge those of you who've been listening what's one thing that you have heard Stan talk about, we've talked about today, that you're going to apply. And who are you going to teach it to? Go ahead and put that in the chat. We want to know who you're going to share that with. Share this video. You can do that as well. Share it with others. Let others listen to it and learn. Um, but don't cop out and just do that. Share it verbally. Talk about the things that you've been learning because those are going to help, um, help you learn it more deeply, understand it better, 
and remember it better as well so it benefits you as well as benefiting those that you're sharing with. Um, so yeah, look forward before, to go ahead. Yep. Before we sign off, if you don't get uh, the blog post that uh, our host puts out, our hostess puts out, I strongly encourage you to do that. Uh, I, I enjoy reading those and I'm always learning something from what you put out. So uh, just uh, get those as well. And um, we're, we're just all beggars trying to help each other find bread. <laughs> That's so good. And I just put the link for the blog. You can go there as well if you're if you don't yet receive that. And um, Lisa says she's going on a prayer walk in a Muslim area of her city, and she's going to share this with her team. Great job, Lisa. Look forward to the others of you also commenting on what you're going to do what, with what you've been learning, who you're going to pass it on to. Stan, would you just pray a blessing over us, those of us who are watching and involved now, but even those that will watch this later, and we'll close with that. Yeah. So, Lord, thank you for this group that... Uh, has been able to join from all over the world. And Lord, it really is a beautiful example of how you are uh, reversing the curse of Babel. You're bringing together the nations into your, into your body, into your family. And you're bringing people from Asia and Africa and uh, North and South America and Europe and the Middle East. And you're you're creating a new family. So I want to thank you for everyone on this call and for those who are going to listen in the future and for those that these people uh, serve alongside of and serve to reach with the gospel. Lord, we want to have the mind of Christ. That's the number one mindset shift, really, mm -hmm. is that uh, Christ, you in us, you're the only hope that we have of glory. And uh, we want you to renew our minds and continually give us your mind and not our mind and so lord thank you for our time together we do pray that we would apply the things we've learned and that um, you would continue to shape us to both uh, know and and obey the things that uh, are your truth and your principles and we pray this all in jesus name amen Amen. Amen. God bless. Thanks so much. And we'll see you again somewhere, I'm sure, Stan. All right. Thank you. Appreciate Bye -bye. you having me on.